of cosmic power throughout the universe from which universes are manifested. In the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, which I will talk about this morning, Patanjali mentions in the first chapter the usefulness of meditating on Om, that is, meditating on the significance of what it is. It is said to be the emanation of the expressive aspect of ultimate reality or God, and therefore is evidence of its existence. Whenever we are, are aware of something, we know that something caused it to be as it is, something caused it to express. So when OM, the cosmic vibration, is, is uh, acknowledged, then we have to acknowledge that it has a cause. Something caused it, something produced it, and that something is the ultimate reality. This is why Patanjali said you can meditate on OM. That is the significance of it. What is it? It comes from the source uh, from which every, everything comes. So you listen to Om, you chant Om, you listen to Om, you think of the cosmic power as an expression of ultimate reality, and then aspire to experience that ultimate reality, to have a, a, an experience of communion with it, of identification with it, and then eventually go beyond that preliminary experience of communion or identification to transcendence, to experience pure existence, pure being, the absolute. And so this is the way to use OM when meditating. Contemplate the significance of it, what is its origin. Identify with that origin, or at least hope to do so, and then even go beyond that to that which supports it, to the transcendent or pure uh, aspect of ultimate reality. Patanjali uh, is a person who is said to have lived about 2,000 years ago in India. Scholars are not uh, unanimous in their uh, what they say about Patanjali as far as his exact date of origin, but it's approximately 2,000 years ago. And uh, Patanjali didn't originate the, the philosophy or practices of yoga. In the first uh, sutra, uh, and I'll explain about sutras in a moment, in the first sutra or, or verse, in the first chapter, Patanjali starts out by writing, now I will explain yoga, uh, an ancient tradition. So he was, he was uh, going to explain something that has been known before his time. So he didn't originate these ideas or these practices, but he simply put together what the information that he had assembled that had passed on down to him uh, through the ages from other enlightened uh, people. Now the word sutra is a Sanskrit word it simply means a thread or a cord or something that, that, that ties things together. In fact, uh, the word we use in the West for suturing or sewing uh, is derived from uh, the word sutra. Uh, Indo-European language uh, preceded uh, most of the, the languages that we know today. There was a language uh, that existed several thousand year, years ago uh, and is called Indo-European. From that, 
Persian and, and, and Sanskrit and many of the languages in India, Hindi and others, and most of the European languages, including English, are all derived from Sanskrit. So the uh, <clears throat> word sutra simply means thread or cord, that which ties things together and uh, or sews them together. And so the sutras are, are very concise statements uh, on, a, on a given theme that are, 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 were designed to be memorized because back 2,000 years ago, they didn't have printing presses. So they didn't have a way to print books. And books that existed had to be copied by hand. So there weren't many books available. And uh, so in India, and I'm sure in other cultures, there was the custom of memorizing the teachings. And so the te teachers would teach in very short, simple statements, and uh, they're called sutras. And the student or the listener would memorize those statements and reflect upon them and think about them and have insight, eventually have insight into, into the meaning of the statement. Then a collection of these sutras or a collection of these short uh, statements together formed a theme, a body of knowledge. So that's what we have with the so-called yoga sutras. A little over a hundred short statements uh, of philosophical concepts and uh, principles and practice and uh, uh, methods of, of practice for living, really, for spiritual practice. And in the first, uh, the, and the potentially is that text is divided into four sections or four chapters. And the first chapter is focused on self-realization or transcendence and, and how that can be accomplished, how that can be re realized. That is the essence of the teaching in the first chapter. In the second chapter, uh, we move on to how to experience self-realization, the procedures or practices, which in Sanskrit, uh, the word is used, uh, the word used is kriya. A kriya simply means an action or a process or a procedure. And uh, kriyas are practiced to accomplish or realize yoga, or a unification of bringing together of our attention and awareness with our pure essence uh, of what we are. And that is what we call self-realization. We use the word self with a capital or uppercase S to indicate our true nature, what we really are. Behind the screen of the personality, there, we, there we are a witness or an observer or a knower. This is what we are. So <clears throat> this is what we mean by self-realization. We mean experience and knowledge of what we are as a spiritual being. And the various procedures which clarify the mind and enable us to concentrate effectively and be self-realized are called yoga practices or kriyas. But uh, then the third chapter in the yoga, the yoga Sutra deals with what are called the perfections or the siddhis or the, the uh, extraordinary abilities that we might have as the result of being more spiritually conscious. And then the fourth chapter deals with what is called liberation of consciousness or complete clarification and illumination of consciousness which enables us to, be, to live freely as a spiritual being. So let's go back to the first chapter dealing with how to be self-realized. Uh, as Angeli mentions in the very first uh, uh, part of that chapter about what meditation is. Meditation is successful when the 
our mind is so clarified and the thoughts are so settled that one is naturally aware of one's true nature. That is the purpose of meditation practice. And then when one is not aware of one's true nature, attention is inclined to be again involved with the activities of the mind. We have all experienced that, I'm sure. When you meditate, you have your occasions when you're very calm and peaceful, and it's so enjoyable, and you're very serene. And then you come out of meditation for a while, you're all right, you're very poised and calm. And then if you're not careful, you get caught up in external activities. Uh, you, you, you see things happening around you, you you turn on the television or the radio and you hear about political news or local local so, uh, news in the community. And you think about having to pay your bills and uh, maybe your own psychological problems or your feelings of insecurity. And pretty soon you've forgotten your true nature. You've forgotten your relationship with the infinite temporarily. And uh, this is one of the major problems that has been pointed out in many religious traditions, and one of the major problems for people, even those who are spiritually inclined, is what is called self and God forgetfulness. We become so caught up in the outer and with our personality characteristics uh, that we forget that we are spiritual beings. <clears throat> we are forget, we forget <clears throat> this ultimate reality. And uh, so that's why it's help helpful to have daily self-reminding reminding practices, uh, early, early morning meditation to start the day is very helpful. A moment of meditation or prayerful thoughts several times a day is very helpful. Now, so that we don't forget what we are in relationship to the wholeness of life. So Patanjali pointed this out. He mentioned that when you meditate effectively, you have an opportunity to experience your true nature as pure existence, pure consciousness, pure awareness. And, you, and you are, when you experience that, you recognize that it is perfectly natural to, to be like this. But then, when you come out of meditation, if you're not careful, you can again identify with external conditions. And some of the external conditions that uh, we might identify with that result in self and God forgetfulness are, number one, we might be involved with our, with our ordinary thought processes. Our ordinary thoughts, which are good thoughts or useful thoughts, necessary thoughts, that they may be so, so dominant in the mind that we are preoccupied with them or we are restless, they keep stirring, they keep moving. And we, we say, I wish I could quiet my mind. Well, we can learn to quiet the mind, but uh, this constant mental activity, even of, of constructive, worthwhile thought processes, interferes at times with our peace of mind and self-realization. So that's why when we meditate, we want to calm these thought processes. We don't want to suppress them. We don't want to do without them. We want to, ha ha because they are valuable, they enable us to reason and to think and to be creative. But when we meditate, we don't want those restless thoughts to be interfering with our endeavors to concentrate. So we have to learn to quiet them down, to calm them down when we meditate, and to view them with objectivity when we're not meditating. So that we know that I am not my thoughts. I am. I use my. I use my thoughts. I think wisely and, and and effectively. But I am the master of my of thinking. I am the master of my mind. So another another condition that blurs awareness, according to Patanjali, is identifying with uh, what he calls, what are called delusions or flawed beliefs and opinions. And many people have flawed or untrue beliefs and opinions in their mind. And they're very sometimes rigid in their thinking. I'm sure you know people like this. I'm sure you're not like this, but you know people like that who are very rigid in their thinking. And they say, 
that they, they are almost obsessed with identifying publicly with a certain political point of view or a religious point of view or a social point of view or a family-oriented uh, traditional point of view, and they say, this is what I am. And they hold on to that, and they defend it, and even promote it. And uh, if, it's a, if, it's, if it's a flawed idea, flawed opinion, it's a delusion, and it uh, interferes with rational thinking, and uh, creates psychological problems. So, you know, and another uh, condition that can modify the mind and be a problem, if we are identified with it or influenced with it, by it, are illusions. Illusions are called misperceptions. I observe something, but I don't accurately comprehend it, but I think I do, but I made a mistake, and that is an illusion. It is a flawed perception. It is a mistaken perception. And many people have these illusions. We all have them from time to time. We observe, we think we accurately perceive, and we don't accurately per perceive. And so we have the wrong conclusion, the wrong opinion about what we have observed. So these are illusions. So Patanjali says you have to rise above them and avoid having them, really, avoid having illusions. And another factor that, contributed, that contributes to mental confusion and blurring of awareness uh, at times are memories, memories that surface and interfere with concentration, interfere, interfere with thinking, and perhaps the memory surface with also uh, um, unpleasant or troublesome feelings. Sometimes we uh, have memories of experiences that we've had in the past, and when we recall them, sometimes we also feel the unpleasant feelings that we had at the time, if we were traumatized or hurt or, or uh, re rejected or uh, we had, a, had a, an incident or experience of, of failure or disappointment or embarrassment, and or perhaps when we were very young, perhaps we were told by a teacher or an authority figure, you'll never amount to anything, you're not bright, you're not too smart. And we had those memories and the feelings come up and, and they're very unpleasant. And sometimes they cause psychological problems too. If they're very, uh, if they're very strong, unpleasant feelings, sometimes they cause psychological problems. I've talked with people who have told me that they were traumatized, they were, they were pain, uh, hurt by what people said to them when they were very young, or by mistakes they they made, uh, or by failures they they they, they encountered or physical accidents they had. And by just thinking about those incidents, they say they hurt. They have the same hurt that they had when the incident first occurred, when the memory was first implanted in the subconscious. So sometimes unpleasant memories can cause problems or trouble, or, or if they're not unpleasant, if they just cause us to worry or to be anxious. Are overly concerned about superficial matters, or sometimes they simply distract our attention. Even pleasant memories can sometimes be a problem. Sometimes you see a person sitting quietly and smiling, and you say, What's, what are you doing in your head? And they'll say, well, I'm just remembering pleasant times. <clears throat> and it's all right to remember the good times, but if we dwell too much on them and live, and we call it living in the past, then we aren't living in the present. It's all right to, to, to remember the good times and the pleasant times, but then go forward and, and live realistically, successfully here and now. So and then, of course, another situation that, that modifies or changes our consciousness uh, is sleep. And we sleep every night and we, we go temporarily unconscious, or at least partially unconscious. And that is a time for the body to rest and for the brain to be cleansed of toxic, toxic matter. So we need so many hours of sleep a night. If you don't sleep, 
adequately after a while you begin to hallucinate or at least you have low energy reserves and your efficiency is impaired and your concentration is, is, uh, is impaired and you're more accident prone and this is a this is a, this is known for instance even just recently here in America we had uh, well, last week, we turned the clocks back an hour. We have what is called daylight savings time in America. We turned the clocks ahead one hour in the spring and turned them back one hour in the autumn, in November. And insurance uh, companies say that they notice that right after a change of time of one hour, turning the clock forward or turning it back, it changes people's schedules somewhat, and for a few days after that, there are more minor accidents on the highway, little, little minor accidents where people's attention is, is, is not as focused as, as it usually was, and uh, <clears throat> they're a little bit irritable, and they don't work as efficiently, they're not as happy on the job. And it takes several days for them to adapt to that one hour change. And that's very interesting that uh, <clears throat> people are, are, we are all of us inclined to be into, a, into, a, into r routines, daily routines, and uh, just flow along in a routine. And when that routine is changed, and we don't change it at will, that it, we have to change change to accommodate someone else's choice it disrupts our it disrupts our our uh, our lives somewhat so you need you need adequate sleep uh, in maybe six hours seven hours eight hours whatever it is you need you need adequate sleep for the body to rest and for the brain to be detoxified but uh, you can learn to go to sleep peacefully and to wake up and be fully alert when you wake up. As some people, when they wake up, they're very groggy and it takes a while to get organized and to realize where they are and what they're supposed to be doing. But with practice, you can learn to go to sleep, rest peacefully, and wake up. And when you're awake, you're in the present moment, awareness, and fully, fully alert, fully attentive, fully functional, and that's the idea, to always be uh, self-possessed or self-knowing and self-aware. So in the first chapter, Patanjali talks about these states of consciousness, these changes that, that, that ordinary people experience, and also how to experience what, if, what, if, what is called a superconscious state, a transcendent state of consciousness. And this is the emphasis in the first chapter of Patanjali's work. And he emphasizes meditation practice. Well, he also emphasizes learning to live, learning to be objective. And for instance, one, one bit of advice for being calm and peaceful is to learn, is to cultivate an attitude of being unfriendly friendly terms or friendly relationships with everyone and with all forms of life and being thankful for the good portion that other people have and uh, feeling compassion toward people who have misfortune, uh, who are who have difficulties in their, in their lives, feel compassion for them and, and be inclined to assist them to, to live better and be happier and more fulfilled if it is possible to reach out to them and, and help them in, in practical ways. And also to observe the passing scene with what is, re, is, is referred to as dispassionate objectivity, that is unemotional uh, ob, uh, observation. You observe, you will comprehend, you understand, but you are not emotionally drawn in uh, to what you see. That is, you're not overly reactive uh, to what you see. You're able to process information, process it, analyze it, comprehend it, and always be centered and aware within yourself. 
And in the so, so there are various methods of meditation that are mentioned in the first ch chapter of Yoga Sutra, including the contemplation of the significance of all breath awareness called pranayama, which result in smooth results in smooth flowing of the life force or prana in the body. And uh, Lahiri Mahashaya, one of the gurus in the Kriya Yoga system, which I represent, going back through from Yogananda to his guru, Shri Teswar to Lahiri his guru. Uh, Lahiri wrote in one of his diaries that a restless mind is caused by restless prana or restless life force. So when the when you can calm the body and calm the vital force, the mind calms down. When the mind calms down, your awareness becomes clear. When your awareness becomes clear, you are more self-aware, self-knowing. Then we move on to the second chapter of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, his text. And here the emphasis is on practice or kriyas or actions or processes. And uh, Patanjali de defines Kriya Yoga practice, the whole process as simply constructive thinking and living, um, self-examination, what is my true nature, using intellect to, to discriminate and meditation to experience what I am, and three, purification of the small sense of self or what is called the ego or the, the mistaken sense of self-identity. Tending to, the, to these processes is called Kriya Yoga. Many times people will send me an email or call me on the telephone and ask if I can teach them Kriya Yoga. And I know what they're asking usually. They have read Yogananda's book, my guru's book, Autobiography of a Yogi the chapter on the science of Kriya Yoga, and they mistakenly think that Kriya Yoga practice is only the practice of a meditation pranayama or meditation technique, when it is far more than that. Kriya Yoga practice in its entirety is uh, includes right or constructive thinking and living behavior, ethical behavior, and also self-inquiry, what am I, my true nature, and discovery of what it is, and purification and clarification of this small sense of self so that we realize we are not that personality-oriented entity, that we are spiritual beings looking out through the ego or through this false or small sense of self-identity. So this is a way of Kriya Yoga, and it's also called Raja Yoga, especially when there is an explanation of meditation practice. And in the Yoga Sutra text, Patanjali doesn't even get to meditation until after he has emphasized the importance of ethical living and, and constructive living, constructive purposeful living. Then we can move on to meditation practice, because Constructive living and thinking and ethical living uh, is found, lays the foundation for what is called spiritual practice or practices to bring forth and to actualize uh, our uh, spiritual or soul qualities. Then in the third uh, chapter of the Yoga Sutra, Patanjali mentions some of the extraordinary abilities uh, and powers of perception that one might have as the result of being more spiritually conscious. And he emphasizes that these abilities that should just naturally unfold or naturally be expressive are not to be uh, acquired or try, we shouldn't try to acquire them in order to to, to uh, um, be be more egotistical, or to be on a to, to be more powerful personally, or to control 
others and the environment. We can use our abilities wisely, of course. We're supposed to use our abilities. We have executive abilities. We can, we can do things constructively and we can accomplish purposes and we should. But we should, we should do whatever we do, we do, we should do, we should do because it is, we feel it is the right thing to do, the most constructive thing to do. And what we do benefits not only us, but benefits others and a society as a whole and the environment. So we're not to think in terms of acquiring great powers or abilities in order to, to build up our own small sense of self or be egotistical or to think that I'm that we're going to take over the world or that we, that we are magicians and that we can go around con controlling people's lives and so on. We, we don't want to get caught up in that. But we usually what happens as we can become more spiritually conscious is that we are able to think more logically and also we are, are our intellectual powers, our intellectual abilities become more highly developed and we're able to discern with accuracy more easily. I remember once I was talking with my guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, and he told me, he said, when you, you when your, your discrimination is, uh, meaning your intellectual discrimination, uh, when it is more developed, you, you, you can read anything and not be confused. So this is true. When we are, our intellect is sufficiently developed, then we have great powers of discernment or superior powers of discernment. And we're not easily uh, confused or deceived. And we can read philosophical uh, um, concepts and principles and we can understand what is true and we can see see through what is not what is not true. Uh, so, uh, in the third section, there is emphasis on what is called the extraordinary abilities and powers of perception that one might have, <laughs> which ought to be used for the most part to further one's spiritual awakening. <laughs> it's all right to use executive abilities to be successful in life, of course, but. We mustn't forget the ultimate purpose for our being in this world is to be fully spiritually awake. You remember in previous times together when we were together, I mentioned uh, the four uh, goals or aims or purposes of life that every person should endeavor to accomplish or have fulfilled in order to complete their purposes in this world. One. Uh, every person should endeavor to find out what they are best qualified to do by uh, uh, analyzing their talents and their abilities and, and their aptitudes and potential for learning and for 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 functioning. They should find, they should find out what they are what they are best designed to do uh, for their highest good and the highest good of others who will be influenced by what they do. And, and so when we find out what we are best designed to do and we do it, that, that, then we, we are fulfilled, inwardly fulfilled. And we say, I can't imagine doing anything else. My life is just perfect. I'm, I'm doing what I feel I should be doing and I enjoy doing it and, what, and the, the doing of it is is successful, and the results of the doing are a blessing to me and, and to others and to the environment. So to find out where you fit in the universe and to be there uh, is, is very useful. There is always a possibility of growth and learning and adaptation and innovation, of course. But to find out how you can best fit in and perform, uh, use your skills and abilities effectively is a very, very, very helpful thing to do. Second, uh, it's helpful to learn to have all life-enhancing desires easily fulfilled. Notice I mentioned life-enhancing, not all desires, not whims. It's all right to have a few whims and a few little, little personal desires 
either harmless or not going to injure you or anyone else if they're fulfilled. <clears throat> but but the, the desires that when fulfilled enhance your life that are beneficial to you and to everyone who is influenced by what you do. They they should we should learn be able to, to learn to have them easily fulfilled. So the life it doesn't have to be a struggle. It doesn't have to be a matter of hard work all the time. Then three, we should be should be able to produce and or attract resources, adequate resources, so that we can live without strain, and we can be our physically secure, and we can accomplish our purposes easily. So to have abundant resources of, of, in whatever form necessary, so that we can accomplish our purposes easily and efficiently. <coughs> and four, we want to be self-realized to the stage of uh, full enlightenment or full knowledge uh, of what we are and what our relationship to the infinite is and what that ultimate reality is. So we mustn't forget the fourth, the fourth goal or the fourth aim. Many people say, well, if I had the first three fulfilled, I probably wouldn't want, I wouldn't be concerned about the fourth one. Well, you would, because even if you were rich and happy and healthy, and had an abundance of friends and good fortune, there is still, if you weren't so realized, deep inside there would be that that feeling of it, un, lack of fulfillment. Something would be missing. Uh, uh, one of two of my, three of my brother disciples that I knew were very wealthy at a very young age and very successful and happily, uh, uh, happily rich and, and enjoyed what they did, but they said there was, something was missing and they didn't know what it was until they met Yogananda and they discovered what was missing was they didn't know their true nature, they didn't know their spiritual essence. So when they learned about how to meditate and how to be more open to the realization of their true nature, then they were more happy in every way. They were still healthy and functional and rich and competent in doing whatever they wanted to do, but they were also spiritually satisfied inside. Not complacent, but comfortable with themselves and their relationship with the infinite. So the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, chapter in the Yoga Sutra, it, in, in that chapter, Patanjali emphasizes the idea of what is called liberation of consciousness, complete realization or complete knowledge uh, and experience of one's pure essence. And in one sutra he wrote that liberation results when the purity of one's awareness is as pure as one's essence of being. Liberation is the results when one's awareness is as pure as one's essence of being. That is when there is no difference between our awareness and our essence. And we see clearly what we are and we experience clearly what we are. Then that is liberation of consciousness. That is our consciousness is no longer confined or modified or blurred by delusions or illusions or misperceptions or restlessness or prejudice or, or trauma of any kind. And even the subconscious, uh, kindness of the subconscious level of mind are purified. For instance, in the early stages of self-realization or spiritual enlightenment, a person may uh, exhibit all of the characteristics of being self-realized, and yet at times there will be, at a deeper level, feelings of uncertainty or insecurity or anxiety uh, or some impulses will arise of uh, in, in desire or inclination to do something or to react unwisely or improperly in a certain situation 
And they say, where's this coming from? It's not me. It's from their deeper level of, of being. It's from their subconscious. The subconscious mind has not yet been cleansed. And uh, so even when the, the, the total range of the mind is purified, including the subconscious, then there is the possibility of complete freedom or complete liberation uh, or purification of one's consciousness. That's why it's important to continue meditating even after we get to the stage where we have a certain degree of understanding and clarity of awareness. We want to keep on meditating and being engaged in self-inquiry and self-examination until all of the tr troublesome conditions rooted in the subconscious level of the mind until they are neutralized. That's important. Then we're completely free. We're completely, uh, there are more, no more dark areas or areas of, of, that are blurred or, or um, uh, distorted, uh, distorted in our awareness. In the second uh, chapter of the Yoga Sutra, after Patanjali uh, defines what Kriya Yoga is, the practice of Kriya Yoga, constructive thinking and living, and uh, self-examination, self-inquiry, and transcendence and purification of the small sense of self-identity or ego. And uh, then he goes on to say, Kriya Yoga is practice. These things that are recommended, they are, pra pra they are practiced to, <clears throat> to remove, he uses the word afflictions, to remove the troublesome conditions that interfere with self-realization and for the cultivation of transcendent or pure states of consciousness. So that is the purpose of Kriya Yoga practice, the practice of these processes. It is to, it is to remove, to first resist and then remove, cleanse these troublesome conditions that interfere with rational thinking and clear, clear perception of, of uh, whatever we whatever we observe, especially a clear perception of our true nature, and also for the cultivation of realization of our true nature. So that is what the spiritual path, so-called spiritual path, is all about. Uh, if we understand what, why we do what we do, then we are more, more likely to be uh, effective in doing what is necessary to do. So it's useful to know why should I think positive? Why should I be optimistic? Why should I uh, be purposeful and intentional and make right choices and learn to be wise in the choices I make? Uh, well, because you know what the results will be if you do these things. And you know what the results will be if you don't do these things. So that's the marvelous, marvelous thing to me that we have the, the opportunity in front of us that all, when we are armed with understanding, we have the opportunity before us, available to us, to make the right choices, to perform the right actions, to have the positive results that we want to have. In other words, we can t personally take a hand in our own spiritual evolution. I remember Paramount Yogananda saying frequently that it is possible to accelerate or quicken or speed up spiritual, spiritual awakening by concentrating on what is essential and avoiding what is not essential. Many people are so involved in non-essential activities, and, and then they wonder why they are confused and why their life isn't working, and why they are ma not making progress on their spiritual awakening path. If we focus on what works and ignore what doesn't work, we're more likely to be successful in accomplishing any purpose that we have before us. Just as if, like you have a like we have projects, home improvement projects, or projects related to work or community activity. If you know what the goal, what, you, what the end result is that you want, you know what it, 
what, what the end result should be, what, re, what the result you want. Then you know what to do to accomplish that result. You do what you do to accomplish it, you're going to have that result. So the same way with our spiritual uh, spiritual progress or spiritual awakening. If we know what contributes to peace of mind and emotional, emotional stability and physical health and clarity of awareness and uh, improved understanding of higher realities, if we know what we can do to, to, to allow these conditions to be actualized or to be experienced, and we do them, then we're going to have the results that we want to have, that we should have, that we that we uh, desire to have. So we don't have to be spiritually enlightened in order to live right, uh, to make right choices. Sometimes we say, oh, I just was more spiritually conscious. I, I would be able to do this. I'd be able to do that. I'd be able to make right choices. I'd be able to forgive that person or to forgive myself or to to, uh, to avoid procrastination or to get up in the morning and meditate on time and so forth. You don't have to be enlightened to make wise choices. You can make wise choices anytime, even before you're spiritually enlightened, because you get you have a mind, you have an intellect, you have power of intention, power of will, freedom of choice. So quite often we can do a lot for ourselves uh, just by deciding to do it. So, <clears throat> uh, we don't always have to be pray, pray to God to do it for us, or expect our guru or our teacher to do it for us. Uh, there's a lot that we can do for ourselves, even before we are spiritually conscious, before we are spiritually enlightened, just by using our common sense and using the knowledge that we already have. Uh, to, to make to make wise choices and to go ahead and experiment. And some people say, well, gee, I don't always know whether this choice I'm making is, is right or not. How do I know? Well, test it. Don't go burgeoning in, but, without, but uh, test it and see whether or not you're making the right choices. And even if you make a mistake now and then, a small mistake now and then, it's not a major disaster. At least you've learned what not to do wrong next time. So you've learned something constructive. You've learned what doesn't work. And there's a story told about Thomas Edison, who was one of the scientists in America, who many years ago was working with the light bulbs and the lighting system, electrical systems. And uh, he was he said that when he was trying to figure out what kind of filament to use in a light bulb that would persist and produce light, that he went through more than a thousand different substances before he found one that would would work. And when he was asked by a reporter and it was if he wasn't disappointed at his failures you know, a thousand times by not finding the right substance, he said, no. He said, I was not defeated, I was not disappointed. I just knew a thousand ways it wouldn't work. So he was had a positive mental attitude, and he kept that until he found out what did work. <clears throat> so that, <clears throat> that's the way to go, to go with your spiritual, spiritual practice. Paramahansa Yogananda said one time that back in the 1920s, when he was lecturing to large audiences in the United States, a man came to him after one of his talks and said, Swami, I'd like to hear you talk. I enjoy being with you. But he said, how do I know that what you tell me is of value to me? How do you know, how, how do I know that what you say will be of benefit to me? And so Yogananda said to him, you try it for six months exactly as I tell you to do it, and then come back and report. So he knew that if the man would follow the procedure, eat right, think right, live right, meditate right, in six months he's going to be able to report positive results. He would, it couldn't be otherwise. If we do what we know we should do to be successful, 
in any given venture, we're bound to be successful. We're assured to be successful. So it is true on the spiritual path also. And in closing thought, Patanjali wrote in the first uh, chapter of the Yoga Sutra, progress and progress in spiritual awakening can either be slow and gradual or faster or very fast according to the intensiveness or the focus of concentration. Not the, not the forcefulness, but the focus of concentration. If we focus our attention on what works and what isn't useful and to stay with it, we're, we're going to have uh, positive, fast results. So it's a matter of focus of attention and making the right choice and then staying with it. So I've enjoyed our time together. It seems like time goes so fast. We've had an hour already and just gone just like that.